The podcast you're about to listen to may contain random lines from musical theater, terrible attempts at original accents, and a sincere discussion about mental health. You have been warned. Are you ready to start singing with your feet? Formidable! Allez, c'est parti! Non, nous ne sommes pas fous, nous ne sommes pas ivres, nous sommes juste dans la joie. Une joie profonde, nos cœurs, elles inondent. Cette joie, elle vient du ciel, non, nous ne sommes pas fous. Welcome to Sing With Your Feet. My name is Lily Fields, and I'm going to be your fairy godmother for the next half hour or so. On this podcast, my goal is to help you, Cinderella, rediscover all the ways you make this world a better place. The truth is that we forget. Oh, the people around us don't forget, but we forget. We forget that we might once have had a sense of purpose to our lives, or that we used to feel like time would stand still while we did things that we loved and that we were good at. Those things, the having purpose thing and the time standing still thing, from where I stand today, they look like they happened when I was at the top of my game. You know, like back when I was young, back before my hair decided to do this Corella Deville thing, back before I had kids, back when I had my whole life laid out before me like Simba in The Lion King. When life starts its inevitable downhill roll, we lose sight of our own passions and we lose sight of what it is that we have that no one else has. That thing that makes the world a better place. It's out of necessity, naturally. I mean, whether we like it or not, bills stack up, children need to be fed, and the oil needs to be changed on the car. It's a gradual roll, just gravity acting slowly on us, slowly distancing us from that feeling that everything we surveyed was ours. Kids speed up that downward roll for sure. And the next thing we know, we are someplace that we don't recognize on a path we can't navigate in a body we scarcely know anymore with years of unprocessed emotions and a feeling that the world would be just fine without us. Does that sound overdramatic? Well, I have a flair for the dramatic, yes. But for the Cinderella that I'm talking to today, You have had some version of those thoughts. Late last year, I was interviewed on a French program called C'est Pascal qui régale. It was kind of an accident that I was asked to participate. My friend Jonathan Moulin of Seven Productions here in Meadows, France, whom I thank at the end of every single episode of the podcast, was the producer on that show. And one of their guests canceled at the last minute. Jonathan on a whim, and knowing that I'm game for just about anything where I can have an audience for my philosophical rantings, suggested to the host, Pascal, that I might be someone who could step in and pinch hit. So I did. I showed up wearing my loudest outfit to talk about what it meant for me to find my way out of postpartum depression, and how reconnecting with the things that used to bring me joy helped restore my self-esteem. After my appearance on the show, I was contacted by several women whom thanked me for actually talking about postpartum depression and others who were looking for help to face their depression. And it was as I talked to other people who were facing the reality of postpartum depression that I realized that I know nothing about postpartum depression. I lived through it by the grace of God, but every single version of it is different and every single person experiences it differently. Postpartum depression is a hormonal free-for-all that affects each person at their points of weakness. For me, I could keep up appearances, being a warm and tender mother when I had a public, but the moment that no one was watching, I became a cold shell of a human being. I've always been someone who struggled with authenticity, so it was almost no surprise that it manifested this way for me. The public-facing mask has always been my default mode. Others cannot keep up appearances at all, and they can't even get out of bed, let alone care for someone else. For some, it's about not being able to connect with their infant, and for others, it is irrational fears about the well-being of their child, and for others, it's a fear that they themselves will hurt their child. These manifestations are all different, all so idiosyncratic to the individual. Some people need drugs, 
Others need a midwife to help them gain confidence. Some need counseling. Others just need support from friends and family. Others muscle through it and somehow manage to survive the worst of the hormonal ups and downs on their own. I'm on the other side of those several very complicated years, which were an acceleration of that downward roll that we talked about at the top of the episode. The spot I landed in when I finally stopped rolling was so far removed from where I had been at the top of the hill that it took me years to figure out where I even was, who I was, and where I wanted to go from there. So after I did that interview last year, I made a decision that I needed to revisit that time of postpartum depression, if only for my children's benefit. I needed to revisit that time when I was wearing that mask and was unable to connect with my children and try to dig up some memories beyond what the photographs and a few hazy images in my mind told me was happening. My kids needed to hear stories about what they were like when they were babies, and I needed to dig deep and find those stories. They say that memories are forged through emotion. So when we have a strong positive or a strong negative emotion, it helps brand the memory into our brains. People who experience trauma often have no memory whatsoever of whole spans of their lives. In many ways, that's how the first few years of my children's lives look to me. Just blank, emotionless, empty space. But now that it's over and I'm genuinely doing well, I want to dig around a little bit. I can start pulling out a few silvery threads here and there from that time that otherwise seemed like a perfect haze. Lest you be saying to yourself, I've never experienced postpartum depression, I want to tell you that any time we find ourselves adrift in our own lives, digging around a little bit to look for the tiny threads of joy can be a way to help us get moored again. We just need to be willing to try. I've said this a million times before, and here I go, a million and one. The golden rule says that we should love others as we love ourselves, which is simply a beautiful idea. It's a terrific framework for decision making. What should I do? Do what I want someone to do for me. But as beautiful as this idea is, I just don't see how it is possible to love others as we love ourselves if we don't know how to love ourselves. When I was sharing my extensive virtue theory universe with someone a few weeks ago, I attempted to define virtue as a character trait that makes someone pleasant to be around. It's one definition that I've tried to throw around to see if this makes this topic any less repellent than it already is. Her eyes seemed not too glassed over by this, and as she looked over my virtue wheel, she said to me, Really? You think self-esteem is a virtue? And I said to her, How do you feel after you've been around someone who hates themselves. And I heard the little ding, 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 because that really, really spoke to her. So my new definition of virtue, one, naysayers, zero. We agreed that self-esteem tempered with lucidity is going to make someone nice to be around. Not raucous or arrogant or self-promoting, but having a healthy self-esteem and understanding of what they bring to the situation and where their limits are is something admirable. So a dictionary definition of self-esteem is confidence in our own worth or abilities. Self-respect. Self-esteem is an attitude of, of appreciation and affection towards ourselves. We could perhaps call it self-love. So now I want to introduce a new character into our pantheon, and that is St. Augustine. He was a 4th or 5th century philosopher who had a lot to say about happiness. Something he said that I come back to over and over again is this. The key to happiness, to true human fulfillment, is properly ordered love. He takes a beat to define happiness as true human fulfillment and then tells us that it's properly ordered love. How exactly do we properly order love? Because if that's all it takes to be happy or to be truly humanly fulfilled, then I might be interested in knowing more. So be careful. This is me, Lily Fields, your fairy godmother talking, no longer St. Augustine. This idea of properly ordered, from my naive point of view, sounds a lot like the idea of prioritization. I don't know if this is what St. Augustine meant, but let me reread that sentence again, replacing the words properly ordered with prioritized. The key to happiness is prioritized love. Let me say it again. The key to happiness is prioritized love. 
I'm not sure if this means that we are to prioritize love, like make love the most important thing of everything else in our lives, or if it means that we are to prioritize the things we love. But let's look at both of these possible answers. The first possibility, that is that making love the most important goalpost of our life, it's really a great ideal. Do small things with great love, yada, yada, yada. Making decisions out of love and not out of guilt. For example, choosing behaviors consistent with love and doing the hard thing out of love. Now, the second possibility is that being able to set up the proper priority of what we love will lead us to happiness. For example, I need to decide that my marriage comes before my kids and my kids come before my friends and my friends come before my wardrobe, which I know is a controversial statement, but it's one I stand by. Being able to properly prioritize these areas of our lives, we will find human fulfillment. Incidentally, this could be a fun exercise to do with the 19 ideal life themes we've been talking about. Prioritize them from 1 to 19. It might be a way to figure out this happiness thing. But either way that St. Augustine meant this dictum to fall, I feel like it meshes really nicely with the golden rule. First, the golden rule tells us to what? It tells us to love others, with its corollary telling us to do for others, in other words, to put our love into action. So, just like St. Augustine said, it's about love. And that we are to love others as we love ourselves means, according to me, that in the most basic virtue of self-esteem and lucidity kind of way, that we must love ourselves first and then love others. So we are setting priorities within love. I think what he is saying is that the key to happiness is being able to put the things we love in the correct order of priority. Overlay that with what Aristotle says about the pursuit of virtue being the path to happiness, then we have something that says this. The pursuit of virtue is the path to being able to properly order the things we love. Knowing when to let go and when to hold on, the answer will come when we know how to properly order the things we love. Knowing when to say something and when to be silent, the answer will come when we know how to properly order the things we love. But before we can make those things happen, we must undertake settling up with ourselves and coming face to face with ourselves, learning to appreciate ourselves and taking the time to know ourselves. I was a parent for all of a month when I arrived at a rather, at least to me, shocking conclusion. Being a parent didn't make me happy. I'm careful when I say this because I don't want one day long after I'm gone and when they are feeling nostalgic for their mother's voice for my boys to hear me say this and to think it means that I didn't love them or that they made me unhappy. So little parenthesis here, gentlemen, are you there? The problem was always me. It was never you. From the bottom of my heart, you guys, you did the best with the mother you had and for what it's worth, I'm really proud of you and I do love you. But here we are, back in the present, me telling you what happened when I was only two months into parenthood. The first month of parenting was a blur. I was incredibly fortunate that my friend Genevieve, the one of the living off the land and they don't understand they are just people people fame, came to visit me when my eldest was about 10 days old. Her visit staved off the realization that I wasn't happy for a few weeks. When the painful waves of fear that I was doing everything wrong finally found a place to echo around in my heart, it meant that Everything about that little baby set off sonic booms of terror. Like, the baby cried a lot. Like, more than a lot. Our nursing relationship wasn't going well, but how could I have known that he was being malnourished when my doctor always said, well, he's on the lowest part of the curve, but at least he's on the curve. I couldn't have known. I still worry to this day that those early months of malnutrition, which I clung to by absolute brute stubbornness, thinking that I was doing what was best for my baby by trying to exclusively nurse him, that those things aren't to blame for the oversensitivity that he has now that he's grown. By the time my sister came to visit at Christmas time of that year, the reality of how miserable I was had fully set in. And yet, being who I am, with my carefully manicured facade of insouciance, I'm almost certain that not a single person suspected that this was going on inside of me. To the point that, when last year I finally confronted someone about a problem that had been festering since no one stepped up to help me out with a group of singers that I had been managing at the time my first child was born, he literally said to me, I had no idea. You were just always so smiley and so you. And I knew it was true. I remembered that one time he had visited when 
the baby was little, and I was so afraid that he would consider me to be an mediocre parent that I had laid it on extra thick that day, making sure that I would be seen as an attentive and loving young mother, a memory which even now feels like it could have been an off-ramp before a full-blown postpartum depression settled in. Keeping up appearances was the only way I knew how to survive. I secretly dreaded having visitors because it meant that I had to put on a mask of being fine, which was exhausting, and yet when I had visitors, it was the only time that I didn't feel the emptiness of how unhappy I was. It was a catch-22. I wanted help. Before people would come over, I would prepare what I was going to say so that they could understand that I was crying out for help. I would come up with a whole script. And then the person was there, and the words got lost. I felt like, like in my head suddenly, I felt like I was exaggerating how bad things were. I managed to convince myself that for that short period of time, I was okay, only to plunge deeper into the darkness after those people were gone. I blamed myself for then wasting my chance to get help. I simply didn't have the courage. One day, I secretly googled parent and unhappy and found to my surprise that this feeling was not uncommon. I even discovered a book called All Joy and No Fun by a woman named Jennifer Senior. I secretly borrowed the book from the library using my tablet, and I secretly read the book. I realized then that it was not unusual for parents to be disillusioned by parenthood, and this woman, having published a book on the very topic, made me feel a little bit more normal. Not happy, but at least like I wasn't the only person on earth who had a serious case of imposter syndrome when it came to being a parent. If I didn't have the courage to address it with a real person, at least I knew that one person out there understood. I was pregnant again shortly thereafter, and by the time I was pregnant again, I was on another downward spiral. Knowing that this happens to lots of parents didn't make it easier to survive. Hormones are real, with real-life consequences, and coming to recognize that our hormones are causing us to think things about ourselves and about our situations and about our spouses that are untrue, it's an entire life's work. Hormones tell us lies all the time. Some days, they tell us that we're irresistible, and other days, they tell us that we're ugly and no one could ever love us. Some hours, we're mother of the year, and the next hour, we are the worst mother that could ever live. Most of the time, these up and down cycles balance out, and we can see the thoughts for what they are. Little lies, the chemistry of our brain concocts, simply because it can. But when, for whatever reason, be it an out-of-whack hormonal cycle, or pregnancy, or postpartum, or perimenopause, or menopause itself... When one or more of those hits, it's like a chemical free-for-all. Our thoughts don't have to make sense. They just feel so real and so convincing that it's hard not to believe them. And following those thoughts, taking them as truth for even a second, can disorient us enough to cause us to lose our way. Yet all the while, on the outside, we can look like we've got it all together. For some of us, our mask is so firmly affixed that the only thing that actually feels real when we're lost in the woods of a hormonal free-for-all is the mask. But behind the mask, we're gasping for air and incapable of communicating what we're feeling. One of the virtues on our list of more than 100 virtues that I think are helpful to living a life with fewer regrets is the virtue of memory. It was one of the first virtues that my husband and I put on that list because it's one of the notions or those big ideas that was to be covered in his philosophy classes. Memory is, broadly speaking, in philosophical terms, the study of history, remembering the past so that we don't make the same mistakes in the future. De chanter, danser, elle pousse à agir, donner, partager, et tout simplement de sourire, aimer. Memory is also a biblical virtue. The Israelites were warned to remember their time in the desert once they arrived in the promised land, lest they start thinking that their prosperity and freedom was of their own doing. Memory is also a psychological virtue. Memory is a mental process. Memory exists in our brains, some kind of chemical process that is mystifying even to scientists. Memory is also a way that a counselor is going to help us articulate what is happening in our lives and how we've gotten to where we are. Memory is magical. 
After I did that interview last year with Pascal, and after I heard myself say a few times here on the podcast that those early years of my children's lives were a foggy haze, I started to wonder if there was a way I could go back and fill in the blanks. I didn't want to rewrite the past. I don't want to try and sanitize it for my children's later consumption. But I want to reclaim those years and see if I could come to terms with some of my disappointments and some of the thoughts that I was having that were a result of my hormones and that I could have caught and turned around, thereby maybe helping myself get back on track. And at the very least, studying those years might help me recognize those kinds of destructive hormonal thoughts going forward and help me brush them away. So I pursued this thought experiment. I had an image of myself at the maternity ward with my youngest. I had my cell phone next to me, and I watched a series of messages spout back and forth between the group of singers that I was responsible for. I'd asked someone to replace me in running the rehearsal that night because I was still at the hospital, and that person canceled the rehearsal at the last minute without telling me. What my thoughts, what my hormonal postpartum thoughts were, told me, no one loves you enough to support you. You are a persona non grata, not even worthy of anyone's second thought, and also, no one can be trusted or relied on to help you ever. That next week, with a brand new baby in my arms, I was there to run a rehearsal because my thoughts had told me that no one cared about me enough to help me. And that anyway, no one could ever be trusted to do what they say they will. This is one of those memories that I had chosen to tell myself were covered over with fog. The rehearsal that night went horribly wrong. My new baby whimpered and whined the whole time. And we got very little done. I was worried that the singers would think that I wasn't serious about them if I had canceled the rehearsal, but I also saw that I was wasting their time by showing up with a 10-day-old infant. Talk about a lose-lose situation. When I sat there with that memory for a while, I could still feel the shame and the humiliation of that rehearsal. I remember exactly which onesie my baby was wearing. I remember the faces of the people in the room. So in the end, I can't say that I don't remember anything from that postpartum period. I did remember some things. I remember feeling like a failure because I couldn't do everything. But I had likewise convinced myself that no one could be relied on to help me, ever. Once I started following those feelings through the woods like Little Red Riding Hood and followed the Big Bad Wolf, they became a state of mind. And quickly, after they had become a state of mind, they became an attitude. Self-loathing, self-reliance, mistrust. Those became attitudes that influenced how I would go through the next years. Every morning for the last few weeks, I've been working on my increasingly complicated applied theory of practical virtue. It is a sprawling theory which cross-references the different virtues, shades them from one to the next through their orientation, and it develops the nuanced idea of the opposite virtue, like generosity and frugality, and the opposite of the virtue, like generosity and stinginess, and attaches them to the ideal life themes to see where those ideal life themes intersect on the virtue level. Yes, I have told you this has become an obsession. So the morning that I decided to think back through that one particular event, early in the postpartum depression that had impacted my thoughts and attitudes, I started to consider how virtue might have helped me see that more clearly. I'm not saying that this is a cure for postpartum depression. Don't hear what I'm not saying. As we say here often, if you need mental health support, please get it. I'm not proposing a cure or an alternative to treatment. What I'm doing is looking to see how I could go back and learn from something that was a very dark episode in my life and apply those lessons going forward. It so happened that I'd been busy filling in the opposites of the virtue column that morning, and for the virtue of self-esteem, I had written self-loathing as its opposite. And for teamwork, I had written self-reliance. And for trust, I had written mistrust. This exercise of revisiting the situation and putting words on the virtues that could have been helpful at the time, it was like a healing balm. If I could go back and fill up my mind with different thoughts, I would go back to the virtues. Self-esteem, teamwork, trust. The pain and loneliness that comes with self-reliance, self-loathing, and mistrust are the kind that I could have arrived at my deathbed carrying with me. But today, I can choose to live the rest of my life so that I know my value, that I love myself, no matter what happens around me. I can work together with others to do more than I could do by myself, even when it doesn't pan out. I know that teamwork is always more fun than suffering alone in silence. 
And I can continue to trust others, knowing that they're human too. They might fail me, but that their failure is not my problem. The virtue of memory helps us write a new ending to the past. Those themes that seem difficult and painful at the time can become lines in the sand to which we say, never again that. Refusing to turn around and look at those difficult times is like ignoring a gold mine in our own backyard. We can sift through those memories of the past and give them a positive outcome in the present. I'll be honest, I have cried more times than I usually enjoy crying as I've started down this road. But these last few weeks, I have felt freer to talk with my boys about their infancy. Some not awful memories of their early babyhood have started to emerge from that fog, and I discovered that they like to hear about it. This week, I want you to consider how the virtue of memory shows up in your life. Do you have rituals, traditions, objects that you keep because they connect you to parts of your past in a positive way? Are there rooms in your memory that are bricked off to which you've refused yourself access? Why? Do you need to get professional help to get in there and learn what you need to learn? Loving yourself with just a modicum of self-respect is key to living out the golden rule. Think of how much you could learn about yourself if you just let yourself remember. So here we are, the part of the podcast where we talk about the golden rule and my New Year's resolution, which was to live out the golden rule as many ways as possible this year. So it stands to reason that the two human beings who try my desire to live out the golden rule the most be the two human beings that I gave birth to. They are little, slowly but surely growing up. It's the relationship between the two of them that seems to not evolve at all. I mean, they have the same irritated reactions with each other all the time, and it just makes me so, so, so angry. But this week, my eldest experienced a kind of crisis, the first of many, I'm sure, but a crisis that did not come from inside the house, and that there was nothing that any of us in the family could do to help. I certainly wasn't ready for it, and my youngest, who was present for the crisis, wasn't either. It was after school, on our way home, just the three of us in the car, and my eldest worked himself up into a frenzy. You know, I am particularly skilled at the occasional ill-timed tantrum. I've definitely had my fair share of those over the year, and a few of them rather recently. Whether hormonal or just because the dam has finally burst, a good tantrum can do wonders to free up space in our hearts. But this was my son. So as I was driving the car, listening to my child snapping at his brother unfairly, then barking at me for even existing, I knew that this was going to be a very telling moment for the usefulness of the golden rule. So what would I not want someone to do for me if I were mid-tantrum? Tell me to calm down. So even though my first inclination as a parent to a child who was being super duper nasty to his brother and to myself was to tell him to calm down, I crossed that off my list of possible reactions. I certainly wouldn't want someone to pull a look on the bright side thing with me either. That kind of thing causes me to put on my devil's advocate hat when I'm having a tantrum, and I can say all kinds of things that I don't mean when somebody does that. So that was off the list too. I wouldn't want someone to act afraid of me or bewildered by my tantrum. I wouldn't know what to do with that kind of power, and I think it would upset me even more. And I definitely wouldn't want someone to try to solve my problem. Validate. That is all that I would want someone to do. Validate and then shut their mouths. You must be so angry right now, I said, finally daring to speak, and you are right to be angry. Phew, he stopped kicking my seat, so there was that at least. I'm angry too, the little brother chimed in. That just makes me so angry. Now we're all angry, I added. (laughs) I glanced in the rearview mirror and I even saw a slight smile. The bad mood didn't end there but the tantrum did. Later in the evening, he let me hug him, and I told him that he had really dealt with this disappointment like a champ. He hugged me a little harder, which I guess means that we were on the right track. The golden rule rules, right? Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. I don't do this often, but I would like to ask you to go back to your podcast player and give a rating and a review to the show, preferably a five-star glowing review. Those are the kinds of reviews that will help people find us here. Thank you in advance. 
I want to give a great big thank you to Jonathan Moulin and the crew at Seven Productions here in Mulhouse, France for the use of the song La Joie as the intro and the outro to the show, to Matt Kugler who sang it, and to Claude Egwe who wrote it. This is your fairy godmother signing off. Just remember, it is never too late to start singing with your feet.